Just curious, how many of you were here last night for the Stephen Curtis Chapman concert? Yeah, it was just me and 900 of my closest friends. It was great to see the place packed last night, but um, as I was listening and singing along, it kind of took me down a trip down memory lane because it was 20 years ago this Friday that our family left behind a career in finance, our family and our friends for a great adventure that God was leading us to in ministry in Pennsylvania. And so each morning, Cindy and I would load our four kids, our four young kids up in our Dodge minivan and our golden retriever. And before we started, we would pray and then we would put a cassette in. You remember cassettes? It, we would put that in the stereo and listen to Dive by Cetus Curtis Chapman. And it was for us, it was we were diving into a new life. And what a great memory it was uh, to be brought back uh, by those memories and be reminded that God is the one that led us then. He is the one that continues to lead us now. Well, uh, in recent times that I've been up here, I've done some word association with you about Bible characters. For instance, I say doubting and you say Thomas, right? What if I said the name Bartimaeus? What adjective would you put in front of that name? Blind, Blind Bartimaeus, right? That's who we're going to be talking about today. Well, as I was preparing for this message, I was reminded of the author H.G. Wells. Now, you probably remember some of his better-known works like The Time Machine, The Invisible Man, and The War of the Worlds. But he also wrote a lesser-known short story called The Country of the Blind. Now, this is about an inaccessible, luxurious valley in Ecuador where, due to some strange disease, everybody is born blind. After about 15 generations of blindness, nobody had any personal memory or could even recall anybody talking about what it was like to see. Now, finally, a man from outside of the valley, a man who could see, literally fell into the valley. I mean, literally fell off a cliff into this valley. And after he fell off this cliff, and yes, he did survive, he stumbled into this forgotten country. And then he realized that everybody in this country was blind. And he remembered the old saying, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Well, H.G. Wells wrote uh, that this, bl uh, this seeing man tried at first on several occasions to tell the people of sight. And in a few instances, some of them would try to listen to him. They would uh, bow their head down and they would turn their ear towards him and they would listen, but nobody ever believed what he had to say about the possibility of seeing things and what he saw. They thought he was crazy. But this young man fell in love with a girl and the girl's father, Jacob, went to a doctor about this man who could see to see if there was anything that could be done about it. And here's the conversation they had. The doctor said, I think I may say with reasonable certainty that in order to cure him completely, talking about the man with sight, all that we need to do is a simple and easy surgical operation, namely to remove these irritant bodies. Remove these irritant bodies. He's talking about surgically removing the guy's eyes. And the father asked, and then he will be sane, because of course it would be crazy to be able to see, right? The doctor said, then he will be perfectly sane and quite an admirable citizen. Thank heavens for science, said the, man, or the, the girl's father. Wells goes on to point out that the man would not be allowed to marry this uh, guy's daughter unless he submitted to an operation that would remove his sight. So you're wondering, what did he do, right? Well, he had decided he was going to go through with it, and while he was waiting for the operation to take place, he wandered into this beautiful valley, and he saw uh, these meadows with beautiful white narcissus, uh, it was about sunrise, and so he saw the sun coming down through the valley, and he described the sun coming down like an angel in golden armor, marching down the slopes of the mountains. And it was at that moment that he decided that he could not go through with this. He realized how crazy it was for him to submit to this operation. 
And so the man who could see escaped with his sight the country of the blind. Now, I know, all of you hopeless romantics are saying, oh, but he was supposed to give up his sight for the love of his girlfriend, right? That's not the way it was written. Deal with it. <laughs> Last month, I shared with you about Zacchaeus, the man who went from greed to God. And at one point in the sermon, I told you about a chronological study Bible. And as I was looking back at that Bible, as I was preparing for this, I realized that Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus met Jesus at almost the same time. And so uh, let's read this passage. It's in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. So I expect to hear this. People opening their Bibles. Open your, uh, your phone apps. I want to see the glow on your face. If you don't have either of those, there's a pew Bible in front of you. It's on page 795. So as you're turning there, Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52, we're going to learn about why did God make me like this, the life of Bartimaeus. All right, beginning at verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he, Jesus, was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, Jesus is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and he followed him on the way. There are several striking similarities in the stories of these two men, Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus. The similarities are both of these men are social outcasts. No one wanted to associate with Zacchaeus because he was a traitor. And no one wanted to associate with Bartimaeus because he was blind and a beggar. Both of them have physical limitations. Zacchaeus is extremely short and Bartimaeus was blind. Both of them are outside of the Jewish community even though they were born into it. Neither of them could go into the temple but there are also some very distinct differences, and let me share those with you. Yes, both were social outcasts, but Zacchaeus' decisions had led him to being an outcast. He chose to align himself with the Roman government and to take advantage of his fellow Jews. Bartimaeus was an outcast because he was blind, and there was no choice that he had in that. Physical limitations. Well, being short, even extremely short, was embarrassing for Zacchaeus, and it could have uh, caused some physical problems as well. But being blind took away any possibility that Bartimaeus had for a normal life, including uh, having a job and earning a living. Uh, being excluded from the Jewish community, Zacchaeus' choices and his actions labeled him a sinner and an enemy of the Jewish people. And this kept him out of the temple. Bartimaeus was not allowed in the temple. Why and what makes me come to that conclusion? Well, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which is, about, which is about to happen. That's why Jesus is leaving Jericho and going to Jerusalem. This is about to lead into Palm Sunday and the, the last week that Jesus was on earth about uh, the trial and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. That is all about to happen. But as Jesus is leaving Jericho, he is leaving a very popular man. And so he is getting the attention of his opponents, who were the religious leaders, who were jealous of his popularity, and they also feared the loss of their power over the common people. For some time, the religious leaders have been looking for reasons to accuse Jesus of breaking the Mosaic law. 
as a background to the story of Bartimaeus, let's read the story about when Jesus cleansed the temple. That's in Matthew chapter 21. Just go back one book to the left. Matthew chapter 21, that's on page 775 in the, in the Pew Bible. And we're going to begin at, page, uh, at verse 12. Matthew 21, beginning at verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. The religious leaders were enraged by his cleansing of the temple, yes, because they had lost a flourishing business. The buying and selling applies to the animal sacrifices that they were selling at exorbitant prices, as well as the currency exchange that they were doing in an unfair manner. But there is also this element which is often overlooked, the coming of the blind and the lame to Jesus inside the temple and his healing of them inside the temple. Matthew reports that upon seeing these wonderful things he was doing, they became indignant. Why? Why were the religious leaders angry at Jesus that blind and lame were in the temple? Well, the Greek word that is describing temple is heron, and it's used multiple times in this passage. It refers to different quarters of the temple, and those uh, different uses are temple, temple area, and temple courts. I'm not going to go into a detailed word study, but it's unlikely that the business of buying and selling was going on in the court of, or that it's likely that that was happening in the court of the Gentiles. In other words, the outermost court. So the question is, who was allowed there? The court of the Gentiles was one of several courts attached to Herod's temple. The first century historian Josephus has uh, mentioned these four courts. The outer court was open to all people, including foreigners, uh, to anybody who was ceremonially clean. The second court was open to all Jews, not foreigners, and went uncontaminated by any kind of defilement, uh, also the wives of the Jewish men. The third court is limited to only Jewish males, but they had to be clean and purified. And then the fourth court is limited to the priest robed in the priestly vestments. Now, in this passage in Matthew 21, the blind and the lame came from the outermost court, the court of the Gentiles, and they moved through the beautiful gate and got into the inner court, which is the court of the Israelites, to be healed by Jesus. There were religious implications of being blind and lame in ancient Israel, but these were specific to serving as a priest. They're found in Leviticus chapter 21 and also in 2 Samuel 5. The prohibition of those who have defects, blind and lame for the purposes of this study, from serving as a priest has to do with the holiness and purity of the Lord and his temple. Blindness, blindness and lameness constituted a ritual blemish. And the priests are the representatives of the Lord in his temple, and because the Lord is holy and pure, nobody who is representing him could be allowed inside that area unless they also were holy and pure. So the argument was made, but it was much after the writings in the Old Testament, that this should apply to all people, not just the priests. And that's why the religious leaders were upset. They thought the blind and the lame were defiling the temple by entering it, and that Jesus was the one who was encouraging them to do so. That's the background for why Bartimaeus was excluded from the temple. So now let's pick up the story when Jesus and his followers are leaving Jericho for Jerusalem. Now imagine a large group of people. So this is Jesus, his disciples, and, and you know the 12 disciples, but then also the people who followed him around to hear his teaching. 
But then we're told that there are other people who are following him as well. So we're told it is a mob of people. And they're leaving Jericho. They're walking along the road on their way to Jerusalem. Uh, perhaps they are expecting, you know, maybe they've heard, well, maybe this is the Messiah. And so they're thinking, okay, he's heading to Jerusalem. That probably means that he's about to set up his earthly kingdom and throw out the mean Roman people and set up his own kingdom. That's what they were hoping for. That's not what Jesus is thinking. They misunderstood his purposes. Jesus is soon to be heading for Jerusalem and for the cross. And the people uh, didn't know this, but Jesus does. And I'm sure that it's weighing very heavily on him. But on at least three separate occasions, Jesus has told everyone that he's heading into Jerusalem so that he can die for the sins of the world. Let me just read one of those to you. This is from Mark 10, 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. They should have known, they should have understood. Well, let's try to enter into the feelings of this scene. There's probably astonishment going on, there's fear, there's probably some uncertainty. Everybody is probably on edge, uptight, stressed out. Jesus is focused on one goal, to get to Jerusalem in order to suffer and die for the sins of the world. And as this group leaves the city of Jericho, they see a blind man by the roadside. Now, actually, it's kind of ironic because they don't see the blind man by the roadside, do they? They hear the blind man by the roadside. This is a common sight in Jesus' day, but let's not fall into the trap of thinking that since Bartimaeus is the only person that's mentioned, that he is the only person there who is in need of healing. There's probably a great host of people that are sitting there also begging who are hoping for healing. There always was. Bartimaeus is but one obscure nobody among a host of beggars that is hoping for a coin or maybe a, 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 just a little morsel of food from one of the people who is passing by. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Bartimaeus. We do know that he is one of very few people mentioned in the Bible who is healed by Jesus, and we know his name. We know also his father's name. His father's name is Timaeus. You see the connection there? Bartimaeus. Timaeus, that's because bar, those three letters, mean son of. So Bartimaeus is the son of Timaeus. The fact that we know Bartimaeus' name also could imply that the early church may have known him and his family. Remember, Mark is writing this gospel to specific people. He's not writing it, skipping over that first generation of believers and, and thinking, oh, I'm going to write this to the people in Erie in 2022. He wrote it to a specific group of people, and the reason why he mentions Bartimaeus by name is probably because they knew him. It's that ripple effect of Jesus healing this man and bringing salvation into his life that caused him probably to become a part of the early church, maybe even as a leader or prominent member of that church, and maybe even his family. Otherwise, why would he mention who Bartimaeus' father was? I mean, they knew the way that names were made. They didn't need them to say, uh, to hear the explanation of, of what bar means, right? They would have been able to figure out, oh, his name is Bartimaeus. He, oh, he must have had a father named Timaeus. So Jesus is touching and transforming this man and possibly leading his family to be transformed as well. It's also significant that Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside. Now, the word that's used in Greek but for translated as roadside is hodas. And one, another definition of that, instead of using the word roadside, could be way. So the phrase, was sitting by the roadside, could also be translated, sitting by the way. In the Gospel of Mark, on the way, that phrase is kind of a code word that Mark uses for people who are following Jesus. So at the beginning of the story, 
Bartimaeus is sitting by the way, and by the end of the story, he gets up and follows Jesus along the road or along the way. A key question of discipleship for each one of us here today is this, are we, are you on the way with Jesus or not? Bartimaeus gets on the way and becomes a model of discipleship for us by understanding grace and desiring Jesus deeply. Let's look at verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, he had to say that pretty loud because, remember, there's a mob of people there. He wanted to be heard above that crowd. Now, when it says that he heard it was Jesus, that implies that he knew who Jesus was. Otherwise, why would he care? He had heard that Jesus had healed people and performed miracles. I'm sure that in his soul he was thinking, maybe that could be me next. As this mob of people start walking down the road, I can just see Bartimaeus grabbing somebody's sleeve and saying, hey, what's going on? And they say, it's Jesus. And when he's told that it's Jesus, he shouts out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Ever since King David in the Old Testament times, the Jewish people heard of God's promises to send a great deliverer, the Messiah. Let me read to you a short passage from Isaiah chapter 35, and this points to the Messiah being a merciful son of David. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Bartimaeus has connected Jesus with the Messiah, with the one who was promised in the Old Testament as the one who would restore sight and make the lame to walk. He connects those promises with Jesus, and that's why he is so excited. It's important to understand that Bartimaeus calling Jesus son of David means that he is connecting him as the Messiah. At this stage of Jesus' earthly ministry, I wonder how many people who came to him looking for healing actually saw him as the Messiah? Or did they just see him as a healer or a prophet or a great man? But did any of them see him as the Son of God? Now, imagine if somebody was sitting here this morning with us and he just starts yelling out. What would we do? I think we'd do the same thing that these people did. We'd, we'd try to get them quiet. We'd shush them. What these people don't understand is that that poor cry of wretchedness was far sweeter to Jesus than the shallow hosannas that would be shouted a week later on Palm Sunday. Verse 48, And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus' people, or maybe we could call him in today's language, Jesus' squad thought that he wouldn't want to be bothered with someone as unimportant as this blind man, this beggar. Throughout the Gospels, we see the disciples trying to protect Jesus from those who were trying to get to him. And I can just hear Jesus saying, these messed up people, messed up, right, aren't the problem. You're the problem. You're keeping the people away from me that I am here to save. So the crowd shushes Bartimaeus. Jesus is busy, really busy, they say. He has important places to go. He has more important people to see and talk to than you. Now, Bartimaeus was probably not a pretty sight. He's poor. He's unpleasant. We know that he's loud and rude. He's inappropriate. He's socially marginalized. Probably not the kind of person that you would invite home for dinner. But Bartimaeus cried out all the more. Now, this is a different Greek word for cried out. This is krazo. Cry out could be translated here, scream or shriek. 
This is no longer just yelling. This is desperation. And this is also abnormal behavior, even for a beggar. But Bartimaeus has set aside all dignity and any kind of restraint because he wanted it to be impossible for Jesus to ignore him. He is shrieking at the top of his lungs, Have mercy on me! Everyone in the crowd is either annoyed, indignant, or embarrassed, but it worked. Jesus heard him, he listened to him, and he did have mercy on Bartimaeus. Jesus stopped, which of course caused everybody around him to stop because they're only going where he's about to go. And then Jesus told his followers to call him. And this is yet a different Greek word for call or cry. It's phoneo. So the impassioned screaming or shrieking is now being followed by a compassionate call. Come to me. Take heart. Jesus is calling you. Bartimaeus also was also religiously marginalized, not just socially. He's not the kind of person you would invite to your house for dinner, but he's also not the kind of person that you might be comfortable inviting to church. He is one messed up human being, but Jesus had time for Bartimaeus. He had compassion for Bartimaeus. Now, many people would have what I would call the gospel of self-sufficiency, which says, I can make it on my own. I'm good enough. I don't need your religion. Others believe in the gospel of self-esteem, which says, I feel good about myself. I must be okay. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. People tend to assume that religion means getting yourself, your, your act together so that you can come to God and that he, you'll, he will accept you because you're good enough. But that's not the way it is with God. And neither of these descriptions would tell us about Bartimaeus because he's a mess. He can't see, so he probably has bumps and bruises and scars. He doesn't know that he has that big smudge on his face or that he has those eye goobers or that he has bedhead. He doesn't have a job, so his clothes are probably just rags, probably filthy, which means they probably smelled. The gospel is not a message that says, I'm okay, you're okay. If it was, Bartimaeus was in trouble because he was not okay. The gospel is a message of, I'm a mess, you're a mess. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. The church is one of the few places on the planet where we are actually invited to come as we are. We're invited to step forward and say there is something that is bent and twisted and ugly and deformed inside my soul, and I need help. At the same time, we are invited to be thoroughly loved. This is a fellowship of sinners. But let me say emphatically, that is good news, wonderfully good news. We are a company of sinners who, like Bartimaeus, are opening our lives to the amazing grace of Jesus. Verses 50 through 52. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. He threw off his cloak, sprang up, and came, probably ran to Jesus. So if cry out really meant screaming for mercy, I can see throwing off his cloak, not meaning that he gently took off his coat and folded it up and placed it on the rock beside him, but ripped off his cloak and threw it aside and then not just walked over to Jesus, but ran there. And of course, that in itself would have been a challenge for a blind person, right? There is urgency and anticipation, emotion, hope. I can see Bart in Bartimaeus' mind, he's thinking, is he calling me? 
I am running there before he can change his mind. In verse 51, Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Now, this isn't this, a dismissive, what do you want from me? This is a compassionate, what do you want me to do for you? Of course, Jesus knew what Bartimaeus wanted. He's the son of God, right? He knows. Let me ask you a question. If you ever wondered to yourself, maybe you've said it out loud, maybe not, why do I need to pray? Doesn't God already know everything that's on my mind, everything that I'm thinking, whether I say it or not? Well, just say the words. Say them. What do you want from Jesus? Let me give you an example. There are times when I ask Cindy, who loves you, baby? Now, is it because I don't know the answer? Of course not. I know she loves me. I just want to hear her say it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Bartimaeus, I want to hear you say the words. What do you want? But would Bartimaeus ask that of me or you? I mean, why did he ask Jesus this question? Because he knew Jesus could deliver. If Bartimaeus had come to me and, and I said, what do you want from me? He would think, well, what could Pastor Scott give me? Uh, do you have some spare change? Could you get me a Big Mac? He wouldn't ask me, could you heal me and give me sight again? Because he knows that I can't deliver on that. But he did ask Jesus for sight because he knew that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Way too often we make small requests of God. Now, I have friends that when they go to a restaurant will ask their wait staff, how can I pray for you? And far too often these, these replies are just basically comfort. You know, my rent's due next week and I'm not sure I have enough money. Or I need new tires for my car. Or uh, my kids are in trouble at school. Um, my father has cancer. These are comfort requests when they could ask for and receive a full measure of God's forgiveness and mercy and saving grace. What could Bartimaeus have asked from Jesus? He could have asked him for an explanation. How could a loving God cause me to lose my sight? How could a loving God cause me to go to bed hungry every night and not know where my next meal is coming from? Why would you do this to me, God? It sounds a lot like us today, doesn't it? Why did you create me this way? Why couldn't I have been better looking or not struggle with weight? Why am I not the sharpest knife in the drawer? Or, or why do I have this disability? Or maybe, why did you allow this to happen, this divorce? Why did you allow me to lose my job? Why did you allow my child to reject you and walk away from everything good? Instead of seeking or even demanding answers from God, why not ask him for forgiveness and reconciliation and Christ-likeness? Let me return to Bartimaeus' request. He said, Rabbi, which means teacher, let me recover my sight. Did you catch that? He didn't say, let me see. He said, let me recover my sight. That means that he had been able to see at one time in his life, and he's lost it since. That means it's even more difficult a situation for him. He knows what he has lost. I think that makes it all the worse. And I think it's easy for us when we're reading a story, especially when it's not the first time that we've read it and we know how it ends, to let our mind skip to the end. We know how this story ends, and we know that it ends well. But Bartimaeus, recovering his sight, even though it's a wonderful thing, he didn't know that was going to happen at the time. It was far different for Bartimaeus to live this story. Now, we don't know how long he had been blind, but it had probably been a long time. And remember, he knew what it was like to have sight. 
Try to imagine the discouragement, the despair, perhaps even the clinical depression that he was experiencing. Try to imagine going to bed hungry almost every night. Try to imagine what it was like to never be able to have her relationships with other people, ever to get married. Try to imagine what it was like to be so close to the temple and to feel so far from God. He must have questioned God's goodness, his ability to answer prayer, his compassion and love. But then against that backdrop, think of the elation and the excitement and the pure joy of receiving back your sight and knowing that your sins have been forgiven. And then beginning that walk with the Son of God. Yes, a spiritual walk, but also, as we see at the end of the story, Jesus invited him to walk physically with him and to experience all that was going to happen, to see what was going to happen next, to hear what he was going to say. Maybe even Jesus allowed Bartimaeus to share his testimony with people. None of those feelings and experiences would be nearly as dramatic if he had not gone through the dark days of being blind and being a beggar. It's the difficulties of life in this fallen world that make such a stark contrast to the new life in Christ. Let me give you an example from nature. The lodgepole pine trees, they cover large parts of Yellowstone National Park and they offer a powerful example of adversity. These cones of the pine hang on the trees for years. Instead of falling every spring and putting down their seeds, they hang on the trees for years. And even when they do fall to the ground, they often stay closed up and don't open to allow the seeds to come out. So how have these reluctant trees grown to blanket the park with forests? They've grown through adversity. When a forest fire rages, destroying all the trees in its path, the intense heat actually causes these pine cones to burst open and the seeds to fall out. And, and through that devastation, these unique pines are often the very first trees to produce new growth after a forest fire. God never promises that we will escape adversity in life, but he does promise that he will hold you in the midst of every storm and fire, and that through your struggle, he will bring about something beautiful for his glory and for your good. So whether you're facing the dark clouds of tragedy or the struggles of everyday life, trust that God loves you, that he's with you, and that he can cultivate new life even through your adversity. I find it's ironic that a man without physical sight was able to see the things that others saw Jesus physically and, uh, do and also saw his miracles, and yet they missed it. Don't miss this point. Jesus did not heal everybody he encountered who was in need. Why? We don't know. But Bartimaeus needed healing and he asked for mercy. He received both. But God was not under any obligation to heal Bartimaeus. And so that leads me to, to tell you that this is not a formula for seeking healing. Bartimaeus has not only his physical sight restored, but he receives spiritual sight at the same time. His outward healing reflected the inner wellness of his salvation. Bartimaeus' cry can be a mirror in which we can see ourselves and our needs and the example of what our desires ought to be, the deep awareness of our spiritual powerlessness, our own need and our emptiness, and our spiritual blindness. What lies at the bottom of all true crying out to Jesus for the help only he can give. If you've never come to Jesus knowing that you're a sinful person, in peril from your own sin and stained and scarred because of the choices that you've made, then you have never gone to him in any deep and meaningful way at all. 
is the depth of your need as desperate as the cry of Bartimaeus, so that from the core of your being you have to cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. The Bible says that our life is a vapor. It will be over before we know it. Don't hold on to it simply living for yourselves or for pleasure or for ease. Surrender to Christ and allow God to give you spiritual oversight. Take heart. Jesus is calling you. Will you run to him? He's not promising to improve you. He's promising to make a new you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another example from the Bible of somebody who uh, doesn't seem to um, command a lot of uh, exposure. Not many people have ever heard of this man. And yet I believe that he will be prominent in the kingdom of heaven because he saw what most people could not see, even though he hadn't sight. Father, help us to follow his example and, and to talk to you and not uh, hold things back, to let our desire be the greatest desire of all, to know you and not to just ask for things of ease. Father, we thank you for giving us this example and for preserving it for us. In Jesus' name, amen.